Well, thank you all so very much for joining us for the single life this afternoon. We know that you could be shopping and dining uh, on the island of Puerto Rico right now. So thank you for delaying that for us. And welcome. My name is Monica Cost, and I am your host. I am a brand strategist and an author of the new authentic living book called The Things I Used to Do to Sneeze. And we'll talk about that a little later. Um, we have the pleasure of having a guest with us um, who is going to help us in our discussion about the single life, Mr. Patrick Schaefer, who uh, has a lot of titles. He is an author, he is a national blogger for the Washington Post and the Huffington Post. He's a pastor of City of Faith uh, Christian Church. So he is hailing from Chicago and welcome Mr. Patrick Schaefer. Thank you. So today we are here to talk about the single life from a, a variety of, um, of vantage points because people we walk, for those of us that are all single, we all walk in our single life different and we're all single for different reasons. So we'll talk about it from the aspect of your faith, um, of your insecurities, of your choices, and sometimes of your recovery, right, from coming outside of a, a from a, a difficult relationship or one that didn't work out. Um, just a little bit of background on myself and why I'm here talking to you, and then I'll have Patrick tell us uh, a little bit about his story. But I have been in the brand strategy business for about 15 years. Uh, most of it has been personal branding for individuals, and now I do some for companies. But along that journey, I came into some really difficult truths about my own life in seven different areas, and one of those was relational. And I had to make a change. I ended up getting a divorce from a wonderful man who's a wonderful father. But we just didn't have the same values and we didn't connect. And as I was going through those confrontations uh, in those truths, I talked to so many different people and found out that lots of people are not living their authentic lives. And the reason for that is because we are trying to live into the expectations that society has set for us, whether we want to be thin or we want to have a certain title at work or we want to live in a certain neighborhood or we want to buy you know, shoes with red bottoms on it. It's not really for our own expectations and values. It is so that others will give us good labels. And so once I stopped chasing the labels and just got in pursuit of my own value system, it was so liberating, but it is a difficult process because of how we label each other. And so um, that is why I'm here today, um, and I'm excited to talk to Patrick about his journey. But uh, Patrick, could you tell us a little bit about your, um, he's written a book called Love Again, um, but I would like you, would like Patrick to catch us up on why he's here and why he wrote the book. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you all doing? Good. Good. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, glad to see you all here today. Um, Monica, um, thank you for being co-writing this out with me. I appreciate that. Uh, I am a, I'm a church kid. Anybody knows what that means? Like I, I grew up in church all my life. You know, I thought, I thought school was something you did in between going to church. That's how much church I did uh, as a kid. And uh, I was raised to love God. I was raised to love people. I was raised to love church and all those different kind of things. And so, you know, I, I, I was, raised in a church where it was a lot of rules. You know, you had to follow all of the rules in order for God to bless you and for your life to turn out the way you wanted it to turn out. So I was one of those kids and, uh, you know, graduated high school and went to college and then came back home and uh, did all those different kind of things. I came back home and, you know, uh, you know they, they were real big on fornication, you know, and, and you know, flee lust and all those different kind of things. Uh, you know, that was, I'm not trying to put a damper in anybody's crews, but um, they, um, so it was like you have to get married. That was the basically, you know, after you did school and all those different things you did, you know, so you found, I found somebody and fell in love and all those different kind of things and uh, got married at, at 22. I was really, really, really young, just a, a kid. And the amazing thing about it was um, I thought that if I did everything right, that my life would turn out right. Like if we follow the rules and all the rules that our parents give us and all the rules that the church gives us, then it equals out to I'm supposed to have this result in my life. And the most devastating thing was that it didn't happen the way I thought it was going to happen. It didn't happen the way they said it was going to happen. 
and uh, it didn't happen the way I thought God had intended it to happen. And so all of those things kind of crashed and converged on me all at the same time. It was a crisis in my relationship. It was my self-crisis of confidence, and it was a crisis with my faith. I didn't write the book. You said you were an accidental author. I, I, I am too. I didn't write the book um, to publish it. I started journaling. Uh, and over the course of time, it just became this collage of thoughts and experiences that I had, and then it turned into the book. And so I think um, what brought me here was that God wanted me to be able to talk to people on the other side of whether it's a divorce, whether uh, I talk a lot about in the book about losing a, a parent or a loved one, and all the things that we feel like we have a right to have and we accumulate things over life, but we don't always get to keep everything that we, we accumulate. And I wanted to, that's one of the things I want to speak about in the book. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure exactly what all the expectations are for this workshop. We're gonna cover a wide variety of topics and hopefully you will have questions and comments at the end, so certainly feel free and be ready to jump in. I know one of the things um, in just talking about divorce and sort of loss, when I was th contemplating getting a divorce, it was a very difficult thing for any of you who grew up in the Christian church, you know, they like to point out the scripture that says that God hates divorce and it's the devil that's attacking your relationship and you should know this. And so I stayed a little longer and um, to try to reconcile that, but I just didn't believe that a loving God wanted me to feel the way I felt in this relationship. And so how did you, uh, Patrick, start to reconcile your divorce with your faith? I think one of the things that you have to understand is that God doesn't love you less than he loves marriage. And I think sometimes we only have this one idea in the church that God loves marriage. Well, I, I believe that he loves the people who actually make up the institution. And when the institution is destroying the person, then what we have to be able to pinpoint is where do we become faithful at? Do we become faithful to who God has made us to be? Or do we become faithful to an institution? And I think we exercise our power when we choose ourselves. Um, and that's not selfish. Um, I believe that is what God intended us to do because you're God's child too. I'm God's child, we're all God's children. And to deny that and to not be faithful to that, to allow abuse and damage and all of the things that can happen in marriage, more specifically, that can happen in Christian marriages. Um, I believe we lie to ourselves. And so um, I had to stop lying to myself along those lines and really make some really mature decisions about my life or which way I wanted it to go. Thank you. There's been tons of articles written in the Huffington Post and in Essence about black women and their singleness and you know whether we're, most of the time they're you know, not saying that we're single by choice, but we just can't find a good man. And so I'm wondering, uh, and is uh, the black woman's singleness, does the black church have any impact? What are your thoughts on the black church uh, and women and their singleness? Funny. Uh, <laughs> Wow, uh, the, the thoughts of the, the black church and uh, women in their singleness. I think that the church, um, because of the nature of the church, we all come to church for different reasons, but most of us come to church because it is a place where we get profound spiritual reflection and we become healed uh, through God's power and God's grace. Um, and. I would say this about black women, you all are more apt to seek out the help you need than black men are. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, black men don't really go to church because we don't seek help. We don't go to the, the, to the doctor when we supposed to go to the doctor. We may not go to the dentist, but if there's something wrong, whether in your spirit or in your body, you're much more ready to, to seek out help than we are. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do that I realized is that I needed, I needed some help. Uh, I had a good friend uh, and we would you know, sit down every week and we would talk and just kind of download and catch up with each other. And after a while he said to me, you know, you aren't getting any better. You really should sit down and talk with somebody. Uh, and which was one of the best you know, pieces of advice that I, I received because it's not just our spirits that are damaged, it's our head and it's our mind. And until we be able to kind of put those things on the same page and get some syncopation in our life, I think we're scattered in ways um, that we shouldn't be. And so I think that the church should 
church's role is to uplift and to empower us, whether we are male or female. And when we come to church, you know, sometimes people come to church for various different reasons. They come to church to date. They come to church to find, you know, who's eligible and all those different kind of things, whether they're looking at the pastor, whether they're looking at the pew. Um, and if you, you can do that. And there are people who date all in church and all those different kind of things. But I think the focus of the church is to be able to help us piece our lives back together. And when we cease to do that, then I don't think that we are really fulfilling our calling like we should. Thank you. One of the things that you and I talked about briefly the other day was how women and men process uh, our emotions differently. And uh, I was telling you a little bit about my story, how I you know, told my ex-husband a couple times, or my then husband, that I was going, but when I was finally about to leave, he acted like it was the first time that I said it. Can you talk a little bit uh, about the differences uh, in how men and women process the relational information? I think that we were talking, and it was, it was funny because she said, just what she said to me, it was like he thought it was the first time he had ever heard it. I said, well, probably because in relationships, you all are more open to communicate about what's wrong. And a man's attitude in a relationship, well, he may not be happy, but he says, well, if it doesn't bother her, it doesn't bother me, I'm not gonna bring it up because I don't wanna have a conversation about it. So you could have spent two weeks talking about the same thing, and he thinks that's just your running conversation about what you're unhappy with. He doesn't know the depth of, like, this is pushing you to make a decision in your life. And so it sometimes, throws us off that, you know, it's really gotten that serious. You know, like what happened? You were talking about this last week. What happened between last week and today? I think we communicate uh, differently. The problem is that I see is that men don't show up for themselves in relationships. Like um, in my own experience, my ex-wife didn't know any of the things that were going on with me as I was grieving, you know, my loss and all those different kind of things. And I, I tell you all this is that before the book came out, I had a gallon copy of the book. I called my ex-wife on the phone, say, hey, you know, let's sit down, let's sit down and talk. We hadn't talked in, in years, hadn't seen each other in years. I said, well, let's, let's sit down and talk. And so we got together, sat down and talked, and I had a galley copy of the book. I said, I want you to read this. I said, I want you to read it, you know, to dispute events or some of the things that I bring up and nitpick at that. I want you to know that at one time in my life, I wanted the best for you. And... I loved you, and that was my intent. It didn't work out the way I wanted it to work out, but uh, it was my intent. And to let you know that it wasn't as simple as, oh, we got divorced one day, and you were just totally out of my life, because it doesn't happen that way. That's why people think, like, oh, if I just get a divorce, you know, my life will change. Yes, it's going to change. It doesn't always change for the better immediately, because there are residual effects emotionally and spiritually and all those things that you have to go, it's a process you have to go through. But the, the, the problem that I had was that in pop society, men are portrayed to be so shallow, you know, as if we don't care, as if we don't process, as if it doesn't matter. It does matter. Now, we might not tell you what's going on with us, but it, it, it absolutely does matter, and it can manifest in a lot of unhealthy ways, in a lot of ways that, that, that can be detrimental to us moving forward. But men don't communicate. Here's another thing. That men don't always heal themselves in the same place we hurt ourselves. It, it, it's kind of like if, you know, if, if we're together and I'm damaged in this relationship, I don't, might not let you know how hurt I am, but the way I deal with it is to move on. You know, and it's, that's a, a guy's thing. Like, I don't want to talk about it. Like, I'm just, just done. On the other end of it, I find that most women want like an exit interview for like the, the whole relationship. It's like, we have to sit down and, you know, we have to relitigate everything and, you know, bring it on. And, and, and the guy says, well, if we're going to come to the same conclusion, why do we have to have a conversation to begin with? Well, it's because we process things uh, a little differently. And I think there has to be some give and take there. I think that men, first of all, do a bad job of showing up for ourselves emotionally. Like, I'll say this, and this may be a stereotype. You all can correct me if I'm wrong. I think women emotionally dominate the relationship space. Emotionally, like it's all about the way you feel, and he is so <laughs> enamored with trying to make you feel okay that he's never really processed how he feels about it. That one time out of a whole month, you may ask him how does he feel, and he can't tell you how he feels because he's never paid attention to know how he feels because he's been focusing in 
on how you feel. I think we have to create emotional space for everybody, where everybody's feelings can be on the table, they can be accepted, and they can be not judged, and we can have that kind of safe space with each other. Most of the time, that doesn't happen. That is such a great takeaway. I mean, really, just that checkpoint uh, to check in with the men who we feel are kind of like talking to brick walls, but helping our mate to get in the habit of being able to communicate with to us and with us without judgment. Uh, one of the things in, in, the, in my book that I talk about is my emotional truth. And it's a space that I just hadn't really visited. So there are some things about ourselves that we know were specific hurts. You know, my dad left when I was five years old and I vaguely remember him. And so my mom always spoke positively about my father and about men and I had a lot of father-like figures in my life. So I didn't really have that disappointment in that, oh, why didn't my dad love me? I just never experienced that. So I thought that there were basically no effects of my father leaving. Well, what I realized was, and this even affected um, my marriage, was that uh, I read a book called The um, uh, Something of the Gifted Child. I can't remember it right this second. The Drama of the Gifted Child. And what I realized was that the five-year-old was still in me, right? So what she now believed is that someone could love you a whole bunch but still make a decision to leave. Now, my dad has schizophrenia, and the, the other reason why I love him, and you know, I didn't, I didn't think there was anything to forgive was because he left a note, literally, and said, I think you all will be better off without me. Could you imagine what a tough decision, because our lives would have been completely different dealing with someone with schizophrenia, so I always loved him for that. But what it told my soul was, don't get too attached because somebody could not want to leave. So there could be no issues at all that you can know of and they can go away. And so that was an emotional truth that I didn't even know I had. How might uh, women in particular, I think because we, it feels like we come with the most baggage, right? Because we collect all these experiences from past relationships and we bring them into our new relationships and the man has no idea what we're coming with, but if we dumped all that at your feet on day one, you know, they probably go running and screaming. So what might be a good way to sort of introduce our emotions and the things that we're grappling with, uh, with men without, to men without scaring them? Um, a couple of things. I want to go back to your, your point you made about your dad, <clears throat> that sometimes men make decisions to disappoint the people they love because they love them. Um, and whether it's your dad or whether it's some man who says, you know what, I want you to be happy. We're not going to be happy together. This is going to disappoint you, but ultimately, I love you enough to want you to be happy even if it's not with me. Like, those are some very tough decisions about love that you have to make sometimes. Um, I think that when you talk about emotional baggage, everybody has emotional baggage. Every man in any relationship, every woman, we all bring our emotional stuff. Um, the problem is, is that we don't let you all know what's going on with us and vice versa because you said the other person might run out the building screaming or something like that. I, I think that one of the things that I've learned about relationship is that when you put all your emotional baggage on somebody or the relationship, thinking that this is supposed to fulfill me, this is supposed to heal me, this is supposed to be the answer and help me reconcile every emotional issue that I've ever had. It collapses the relationship because relationships aren't built to carry that kind of weight. Um, I think that um, I am an advocate of mental health. I think that if your, your companion is not a, a, a psychologist or a, um, a self-help coach or something like that, I think it's sometimes we give too much. We expect too much out of people. I think that you can never enjoy the relationship if you go to the relationship thinking this has to be my, my therapy session all the time and you have to like stand in proxy for my dad and let me say to you everything I didn't get to say to my mother and all those different kind of things. Like who wants to be, that doesn't sound like anything enjoyable we want to be in. I think that, that seeking out outside help to allow us to come to our relationship and talk about what we've reconciled. Not our open issues to look at somebody to say, 
help me reconcile it. But this is the work that I've been doing, and I want you to share in my answers of how I reconcile these different kind of things. But more times than not, that doesn't happen. And it usually, um, one person says, you know, this is just way too much baggage for me, and I can't do it. Um, and, you know, then it leads to some more emotional stuff that we carry over into our next relationship. Yeah, and you said something very interesting earlier about, you know, it is the notion of coming into a relationship already whole, right? That the relationship is not your place to become a whole person. Um, what are some of the ways, you talked about getting outside help, but what are some of the other ways that people might sort of visit with themselves before entering into a relationship? Uh, I think one of the things is I, I'm a great advocate of reflection, and reflection can happen in a few different ways. You can uh, have a good friend to talk, talk to things about, do things with, or uh, whether it's your church, or whether... Uh, it's journaling. I find that journaling is a great place to feel safe to kind of put your thoughts and put your emotions. I think that if you don't commune with yourself and know yourself, you can't expect somebody else to know things about you that you haven't discovered about yourself. I think the best and the most important thing we bring into a relationship is ourselves and we want to be our best self. And nine times out of ten, we do not bring our best self into relationships. You know, we carry over stuff and pieces of a of of us are over there, there, and, and everywhere, scattered through life. And we're all damaged, you know, we're, we're all in pain on one level or another. But understanding where healing is for us, and where do we find that healing, more, more for us to go on the inside, where God resides, rather than to seek somebody else and to make them God, and try to help them do for us what only God can do. I think I'm a fan of, you know, remember in the old days when people used to have chaperones, if you went out on a date, right, you would have people to go with you. And I read a couple of articles that, that said that people in your circle are better predictors, if that's a word, of your relationship success than the two people that are actually in the relationship because people know you. And I remember after I got a divorce, some of my line sisters they were like, Ugh. you know, I didn't want to say anything, but when I came for your housewarming, I was like, wow, who's that? You know, I just, I didn't recognize you, but I thought maybe that was just kind of who she is now as a married person. But they, you know, it felt off to them, but they hadn't yet gotten permission from me to say something. And typically you don't want to meddle in people's business because either they're going to stay or they're going to tell their significant other and you're going to get into an argument about it and then you end up losing the friend. And so what, is your, what are your thoughts on sort of having a, a person to submit to in your relationship? I think what you said is important because when you're in a relationship, you have no objectivity. You know, you're, you're, you're in it, and when your emotions and your mind are gravitating toward building something with somebody, anything that is on the outside that tries to interfere with what you have your mind set on, you don't want to hear it. So a friend can come and tell you the, the absolute truth, be like, this is the truth about you, this is the truth about him, and all those different kind of things, but you ain't trying to hear it, you know, because, you know, when people make up their mind, they're going to get married, or this is what they're going to do, you cannot talk them off that ledge, and if you try to, they will turn against you, and you can end up losing a, a good friendship. I think accountability, um, and, and growing up and mature, like I tell, you know, like, some young guys I talk to back at home, relationships are mature people. They're not for kids. You know, they're not for something you just to do because you don't have anything else to do. It gets, it gets intense, and if you're in serious about it, then you, you want to be in community. Your relationship should be in community, that whether that's one person you're accountable to or a group of friends that you all group date together, I think that is so important, and it's missing. And I think a lot of times, um, what happens in relationships is you get isolated, especially you all, you know, my sisters, you all get isolated and you become vulnerable to abuse, domestic abuse, and all these different kind of things that you can't tell anybody because you drop the veil and it's, it's, it's secretive. And before, you know, anybody knows it, it's, it's as bad as it could get. Um, and, and so I think from the very beginning, establishing those kind of markers, those kind of safe uh, guards and buffers, I think is very, very important. So there's also always a lot of talk about finding a good man. And, um, you know, um, 
there's often, it is said, that there aren't any good men out there. How do you think uh, women might start to think differently about what a, a good man looks like for themselves? You know, that's a very good question. Uh, I get that all the time. Uh, <laughs> Where are the men, right? And uh, where are the good men? Well, I think the question is, how are you defining a good man? You know, how do we define what a good woman is? A good man for you may be different from everybody else in the room. Um, I think that pop culture and, you know, the stereotypes, whether it's in our music or uh, in our television shows, only portray men primarily, black men primarily, in, in one vein. I think that there has to be some investigation that you have to do on your own to find out that there are shades of goodness in all of us. Uh, all of, you know, every man, there's some good in him somewhere. We may manifest things for different reasons at different times, but there's, there's goodness in all of us. And to say that there are no good men, I think it's a lie. I think it's, a, it's, it's something that, you know, pop culture would want us to believe. But, and as long as we believe that, that becomes our reality. As long as we say there are no good black men, that's the reality we live in, and there'll never be any good black men. I think when we change what we say, then we change what we believe, then we change what we manifest. I think that if you want a good black man, I think you have to talk about good black men, like we have to talk about good black woman, women, and that we attract that in our life. If you're always talking about the dude who did you wrong and the girl that did this, that, and the other, you keep attracting that into your life and you keep wondering why. Well, it's because you, it's dominating your thoughts and it's dominating your speech. And if I could do what I do, you have to be able, as the Bible says, to call those things that are not as though they were. That your words create your reality. And the more you keep speaking what you don't want, the more you have it. So you have to learn how to discipline your mouth to say what you want. And then that's what comes into your life. And if I could piggyback on that, we had a good conversation with a gentleman uh, on the way to the elevator, is that whole defining what it is that you want. I remember when I first met my husband um, that all the sort of checkbox labels were there. You know, he was good looking, he had a good job, he graduated, he was a Kappa, he was, you know, in all the right organizations. And so on paper, he was the perfect guy for me, right? Based upon what the, the labels are that you're chasing. But as time went on, what I found out was that our value system wasn't the same. So when I said I was getting a divorce, people were like, what, are you crazy? He comes home every night, he has a good job, he's a father, and they started, he's a great father, they started listing all the labels of what we want. But let's just take, you know, his value system, he's a very stable, steady Eddie. He's been at the same job for a long time. He does very well, but he loves routine. I loathe it. <laughs> I hate routine. So when he wants somebody that comes home at five o'clock and makes the dinner, and we have movie night on Fridays with the Gaskins, and then on Saturdays we have pancakes, and then on Tuesdays it's taco night, and then, you know, I, I started to rebel. My soul rebelled against that value. And I am also an entrepreneur at heart. I don't like to have the same job for years. Now, I didn't know that until I really found out what my value system was. When we start to talk about values, oftentimes, people will say, well, what do you value? What do we say? God, family, work, right? We list that off, you know, just because that's what we're expected to say. When a lot of times, thank you, we look at our lives, that's not really how we're living. But I value change and flexibility. So somebody who values stability, I challenge the very essence of his foundational value system when I come and I wanna quit my job and start a company. But if you don't know what your person's value system is, then you get to that part of the Bible that says, how can two walk together unless they agree? Well, it is very <laughs> difficult to get past the physical attraction to get to the value system, right? Because you're attracted, you're having fun, you're going to the movies, you're going to dinner, you're laughing. You know, their life is great, but if you don't get down to what it is that you care about and what they care about to make sure that they are complementary or in line, then you, the relationship is sunk, right, from the beginning. So I, I think you're right. One of the, the chapters in, in the book is called Make Love. Um, and the idea is that in relationships like our relationship with God, we are in co-creation with each other that you want somebody um, not who comes with 
their rules or this is what this is, but you, you want to come and partner with somebody and create the love, make the love that you all have, the atmosphere, the flow, the energy, whatever that is. And sometimes we impose what we've been taught or what we think is right on this relationship. We say we love each other, but we've never really created what makes us right, what makes us click, what makes us vibe. And if, you have, if you're creative and the other person plays by this set of rules, well, even though you can love each other, you're not making the love that you want that is gonna keep you there. And I think that, I think we have to free ourselves sometimes from what everybody else says and all those different kind of things and, and find someone or have somebody in our lives who's flexible enough to day by day, every day, every single day, be committed to make sure that we're making the love that we need between each other because that's the only thing that is going to keep us there. And so, that's right. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and so how do you think, what's a good way, because I, it's, it, um, this is gonna sound crazy, but I'm gonna, I'll use somebody else as an example. But a friend of mine is, uh, people are always, men are always attracted to her, but they harp on her good looks, right? And if she's attracted to them, how do you get past the physical attraction to get to that next stage of friendship, right? Because it's sometimes hard to back out of the romance to get the foundational part. Does that make sense? Okay. Can you talk a little bit about I think that? that uh, I think we're all, every, every grown person knows that you could be attracted by looks, but that is not going to keep you. That is not going to keep you. I, I, you all are, are beautiful women, but a man is not going to stay with a woman 50 years because of her eyes. Like, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. There are beautiful women who get divorced all the time, and if it was just based off looks, then they would be married. That's, that's just the truth. I think, that, um, I think that's, that's immature. I think that there has to be some investigation. But i tell you this. Here's a little thing that I use. So, like, in, in Psalms 27... David says, one thing have I desired of the Lord that I might seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David tells you something about how a man processes beauty. He says that what attracts me to God is how beautiful he is. What keeps me is what I can inquire of God. It's the inquisition. It is, it is what's underneath the beauty. The beauty attracts, but the beauty doesn't keep. If I don't buy Coca-Cola. I love Coca-Cola. I don't buy Coca-Cola because the bottle is nice. I, I, I keep buying it because of what's in the bottle. And I think that when somebody comes and you open up this beautiful package and there's nothing in it, I think that that's where we are wrong. Now, that's on both sides of the coin because there are some, some guys who play up handsomeness and all those different kind of things and then you talk to them and it's, hey, it's stupid. Um, I think... Um, <laughs> So I think having something down on the inside of you, um, I think that true beauty, you can't hide it. It's there. And I think when you, when you grow up, you begin to see beauty in a lot of different shades, a lot of different shapes, a lot of different textures, and all those different kind of things. If, if you all, and this is, you know, hit me with something if you think I'm wrong. If, if the only thing you all do is put as much effort into your outside beauty and never the inside beauty, then you can't be mad at some guy from being attracted to what you play up. If this is what he sees most about you, you put more effort in to you know, your eyeshadow and all, and I'm, really, I, we appreciate that. But on another level, there has to be something deep down inside of you that he can investigate. And when there's nothing there, there's just nothing there. And, and society doesn't help us with At that, all. right? Because Man. what do we see everywhere is it's, you know, who has the most beautiful person, car, house, right? Do you have a question? Um, I, I don't know. Maybe it's more of something I want to ask. In our parents' days or grandparents' days, the, the main foundation of a relationship was the commitment. They are committed. I mean, it wasn't just based on looks. I mean, even in Proverbs 31, it talks about beauty is vain, but the woman who fears the Lord. I mean, I think the most important thing in a relationship is finding someone with good character, um, integrity, honesty. Those are the foundational stuff. You've you got to have that in place 
first and foremost. Because you can have someone who's got all the same value system, wants to travel, do all that stuff, but they could be a cheater and a liar. So integrity is so important. And uh, unfortunate nowadays, we, we, we have... Uh, an, an ideology that, oh, okay, they're not acting right, so I'm getting divorced. And we have to uh, really uh, find out what, what, is, what is it that you value? Isn't, you, know, you want a good, decent human being? Someone that's kind and good to their family and who's, got, who's honest. And those are the most important thing, I think, in relationship, not just someone that you can travel with and do all the fun stuff. Absolutely, and integrity and those things are, are actually values. Those are the values that I'm talking about um, that you absolutely need to have. So thank you for your comment. Any other questions before I ask about them? Patrick. So uh, another conversation that comes up all the time is cheating. And, you know, there are lots of schools of thought from different people around what to do when someone in the relationship is unfaithful. What are your thoughts on it? Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just, just really. Um, I, I'll say this, that um, I, was, I was raised where I got a lot of positive reinforcements uh, from my mother and my father and aunts and uncles, grandmothers who loved me. I was never um, in short supply of all of those different kind of things. And as a man, I think we're raised, as a, as a male child, I think we're raised different from, from girls. Uh, we're not as raised as to be as self-conscious sometimes as you are. Uh, you can see a, a dude, you know, big as Rick Ross or something, out on the beach with no shirt off, just, just shirt on, just laying out, you know, just don't, just do not, he's not self-conscious, just does not care. And there's some women who are very self-conscious about their bodies, and I think you would just raise very differently. I say that to say that if, if, um, if something happens in the relationship to a man, and there's something that goes wrong, he doesn't first question himself, like, what's wrong with me? He asks, what's wrong? with you. On the other side of that, if something goes wrong in you all's relationship, you think it's you all. The first thing you go is, it can't be him. Maybe there's something I'm not doing or I should have done and all those different kind of things. And so I want to tell you all to stop that because you can't make anybody come home. You can't make, you could, you could be as good at everything as you want to be and treat him with all the respect, give him all the love, all the affection, all the things that, you know, he says he needs and you can be very dutiful and do all of that. But if a person doesn't have integrity in him, he doesn't have character in him, none of that's going to keep him. And you all come away feeling like, oh, well, I, if I could have done this or if I could have done that and all those different kind of things, none of those things serve you. It just allows you to, to break up yourself, fragment yourself, whereby when somebody who wants to love all of you, you question, why do you want to love me since the last guy didn't do that? So I think there's a, there's a distinction in how we are, we are socialized as children that affects us in our relationships. I just say that that's not healthy because there's, it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you because somebody didn't react or wasn't faithful or wasn't committed to you. There's nothing wrong with you. It has everything to do with grown people making decisions that you cannot control. So stop that. <laughs> There yeah, you have it. I, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I just it. Yeah, it, it doesn't serve you. It doesn't serve you. Any other questions from the audience? I'm sorry. Yes. And you just said question. I'm just curious. Did your book came out because you cheated, or maybe your wife cheated? What brought the book and no. the relationship out? Nobody cheated. Okay. Nobody cheated. Yeah. Uh, I know people, when they write these type of books mm -hmm. from self-help, something brought it on. So, and I know you was in your 20s, you got married. Yeah. I'm just, so no, it was I, no cheating to in the marriage, and you talked about strong spiritual, and I'm just curious, how did it end? Um, well, we got, we got married very, very early. You know, and I, I think that is one of the one of the major 
contributing factors. Because when you, you, when you get married, marriage redefines you in some way. Like it, it stretches you. But if you don't know who you are, marriage will never tell you who you are. Um, it, it is not as self-fulfilling as we think it is. And so if you think it's going to answer all of your questions or be everything to you, marriage is not that. When you're young, you're emotional and, you know, all of those things coursing together and selfish and all those different kind of things. And, and I, you know, we were young, you know, made a mature decision, did not have the maturity that it takes to see it through. So it wasn't infidelity as much as it was realizing like, hey, we were young when we did this. You know, we loved each other, but I wanted, I, I wanted her to be happy. And we would just, for years, just spend time not being happy. And it just got to a point where, you know, a decision was just made, like we can't do this. So it's not, it, you know, it's not just, you know, infidelity that, that shatters relationships. It is becoming conscious of who you are, who the other person is, and realize that, you know, this is just not, this is not gonna work. That was my situation. I know everybody's situation is a little different. I'll just speak to uh, my own situation relative to her question is I was engaged in 2009, but it came to a point where my friends asked the question. Initially, they really liked the guy, but as they got to know him, um, they saw in something in him that by this point of the engagement that I didn't see. Uh, and they started to come to me with the question, are you sure, is this the person that you want to spend the rest of your life with? And if you are, we'll be happy for you. But if you're not, really consider that question. And we got as far as three months before the wedding. And then there were some things that basically, not infidelity per se, but I mean, he just wouldn't tell me the truth when I knew he was lying on a consistent basis. And it was relative to, he had children, I did not. But it was relative to that. But what I had to think about, even though most of the wedding was paid for, everything was in place, to make the decision that this is a party for a day. But what about the rest of my life? And now it's been four years and the decision not to get married to him, even though, as you said before, there's a good part of him. Uh, he's a good guy. He loves his kids. No problem with that. But he wasn't the best guy for me. And my friends coming to me and well, along with my family, and then God's vision of saying, maybe this is not it. And it was just a point in time that that wasn't the right person for me, but that was the right decision for me. That's great. To piggyback on what she was saying, I think it goes back to what you were saying. A lot of us women, um, we're taught to feed into those labels. And if we don't, by a certain age, by a certain point of our lives, then like you said, I mean, culturally, we're taught if you're not, if you're this age, with this level of education, with this type of job, with this kind of crew, you're supposed to have certain things. If not, society, our family, our friend, what's wrong with you? You got to be. I mean, here comes some more labor, and they're not pretty, especially in our churches. So once again, we're not taught how to be mature in our thinking, be wise in our thinking. Because once again, even spiritually, you need to be married. You like what to you. You know, the, 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 the um, not be adulterous, to not be fornicate. You need to be, but nobody teaches us how to be happy. We're not taught that in our culture. Yeah, it's true. I agree. There's no formal way to check in with ourselves to see if how we've been living and the expectations we've been living to it into are they ours or they are they those that have been suggested to us. I mean, something as simple as not related to relationships, but I was very good at math as a child, and so every adult in my life pushed me towards a life in finance. So I majored in finance and accounting, and I became an auditor, and then I was a financial analyst. And every time I would get promoted, you know, about to be promoted to VP level, I would self-sabotage. And I couldn't figure out why I was doing that. I would either switch jobs or move around in the company, but it was because the values that I uh, hold dear in a position are not in finance. So what you are good at isn't necessarily what you like to do, right? And so I had to think about what needs to be present in a job in order for me to succeed. I had to think the same way about a spouse or a companion. What has to be present in that person in order for me, uh, in order for the relationship to succeed? So absolutely. Any other questions? 
about five years ago when I started yeah, writing the book. Like I was saying, I came into seven emotional truths. They were aesthetic, right? I, time is one of my values. And I had hair down my back. It took me an hour and a half to do it. I, but why did I keep the hair? Because, oh, your hair's so pretty. Oh, it's so pretty. Guys thought it was sexier. So I kept it and I dyed it. And then I said, what am I doing? I, that, that hour and a half, I could be using that to do something else. So I cut it off and then I let it go gray because I hate going to the salon. I, that's just me, right? And so even, I remember I cut it and my then husband said, is there any chance you're gonna grow your hair back? You know, he would ask that every so often. And I said, I don't think so, but stay open. <laughs> you know, anything's possible, but I doubt it. And so uh, that whole value thing is so critical. I had to come into some financial truths, right? Making things look a certain way. I was spending my way right into debt, trying to please, you know, look like something was going on and more was going on than actually was going on. So there was just a whole bunch of truths. And, you know, once you come into those, and it sounds like you had that same experience, it is just life changing as long as you own it. The other thing um, I would like to say before I ask Patrick another question is we've got to stop labeling each other because it's one thing to say, you know, stop chasing the labels, but we need a critical mass of people to participate in this so that we're not putting the pressure on each other either. You know what I mean? Let me add something to that, and this is just my observation, uh, that women are very hard on women. You know, it's very, very critical in, in some ways that that guys aren't and we can't relate to. And I think part of the support system that you could be missing may be in the person that you're, you're, you're judging sometimes, whether it's because of money or looks and all those different kind of things. But it's, it's a very, very interesting culture to, to, to observe about how you all interact. And I think sometimes men treat women the way they see each other treating each other. Um, and so if you all don't treat each other with a certain amount of respect and love and all those different kind of things, it's hard for a man sometimes to get a picture of how to treat you. Could you talk, I also believe that um, you kind of attract where you are, right? So if you are a woman in distress, you, uh, you usually attract a man who likes to save. And as long as you're in distress, he's present, right? Um, could you speak to uh, sort of if you believe that that's true and some of the ways that uh, women might be able to set themselves up for relationships? I, I have a friend who owns a, a, a magazine and um, she's, you know, maybe, you know, mid 30s, um, very smart, got the degrees, all those different kind of things. She met a guy and they, they dated for a while and it just didn't work out. Uh, and six months later, um, he was engaged to some like postal worker or something like that. And then she, she no, I'm not, no, 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 I'm sorry. I didn't mean it like that. I'm just, I'm just saying the, you know, the, the, the wide variance of, of lifestyles that they had. There's nothing wrong, absolutely. I depend on my postal worker, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not casting asparagus at all. But I'm just in saying, mind, in her mind, was, there was a gulf between who she is as a CEO and somebody else who works in another field. She could not reconcile or understand what does this one person have that I don't have. I have this, I have that, and I have the, the other. I said, well, it's simple. I said, well, he has a good job, but you have a better job. And for him to be with you, he has to totally redefine who he is to be able to adjust himself to you with some body that he could pay for her nails and her hair and all those different kind of things a man understands how to take care of a woman like that because that's easy you know he's the main breadwinner and you know he comes home and pays for everything well if he you don't need him to do that a man would we can be emotionally and relationally lazy we would let a good woman go instead of maturing ourselves and let a woman mature us to redefine who we're supposed to be in this relationship. And sometimes um, you talk about women settle, men settle all the time. 
you know, for, for somebody who may not be as smart as he is or because there's power, right? It's, it's all about power, money, power, all those different kind of things. And I think one of the things that men have to do, we have to accept the challenge that just because you have this, that, and the other, we also bring different things to the table that we need from one another. And you can't quantify that with a money, a car, and all these, a house and all those different kind of things. On the other side, I think that um, the way you all wear success, the way you all wear, you know, your achievements and all those different kind of things, because there's power on both sides of the equation. Uh, and power breeds control, right? And so everybody wants to be in control and we want to have this, but really it's about co-creating in that space that I was talking about, is that you have to be able to, to lose all those different kind of things because here's what I say about black people and, and relationships. If, if every black man was rich and every black woman was rich, we would still find ways not to relate to each other and not to be in love with each other. So what does that mean? That the money is not the real issue. Well, let's prove it's, that it's out. Gonna, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's always going to be something that's going to come between us. So the real work of relationship is not negotiating who makes more money, who pays the bills. Right now in our generation, I call this generation of men, I say probably 35 to 45, the sacrificial lambs. They are the generation of the sacrificial lambs. And the reason why I call them that is because they were raised to, to be the man of old. And, but now women don't need them for what we used to need them for. And so they're coming to the table thinking they have to be the sole provider and they have to take.